You know, when I was your age, go ask your mother. I know you don't like it. It builds character. How many times do I have to tell you? I'm not just talking to hear my own voice. Hello, listener, and welcome to Datages. I'm your host, Chad Hagel. And if you are looking for some fatherly wisdom for your career, your family, or any other aspect of your life, then you've come to the right place. If you want to learn more about Datages, find additional content, submit questions or feedback to me, or if you want to know if that mental picture you have of me after hearing my voice matches my real face, visit datages.com. Thanks for being here. And before you listen to our podcast, please listen to your father. Listeners, welcome back to Datages. I'm your host, Chad Hagel, here with the third and final installment in our three-part series on philanthropy. In the first episode of the series, I Don't Believe in Charity, I Believe in Philanthropic Investment, I shared with you my early experiences in philanthropy and how I came to believe in philanthropic investment as the best vehicle for positive impact. In the second episode of the series, the greatest investment you can make in yourself is investing in the lives of others. We talked about my experiences in philanthropy and how I learned that investing in others is really investing in yourself. And today, I bring you this datage. If you think one person can't reshape the world around them, try driving a bulldozer. If you really want to change the world, learn to operate heavy machinery. Listener, let me confess to you right now, one of the things on my list of cool stuff that Chad wants to do, everyone else calls this a bucket list, but I think now that you've spent several hours with me over the past 10 or so episodes, you can probably understand when I tell you that I really don't like the notion of building a list of things I want to do before I kick the bucket. That seems pretty bleak to me and could also be a recipe for procrastination. Anyhow. One of the items on my let's go do it list is a visit to Extreme Sandbox. Have you ever heard of Extreme Sandbox? Extreme Sandbox landed a deal with Mark Cuban and Mr. Wonderful on Shark Tank. And this was in 2017. And they were featured in season four of Billions. I used to love Billions. If I could have an evil redheaded alter ego, I would want it to be Bobby Axelrod. Extreme Sandbox is an adult heavy machinery demolition playground in Minnesota where you can go operate pretty much any piece of machinery you can imagine. Bulldozers, backhoes, cranes, and you get to smash things. I mean, really smash things. Now that sounds like fun to me. And you know, I got so excited just talking about this topic that I literally just convinced myself to book Extreme Sandbox for the whole family this summer. Hastings, Minnesota, you are officially on notice. Get ready for the Hagel family. We're coming. Sadly, this is not the type of heavy machinery we're talking about in today's datage. When I say, if you really want to change the world, learn to operate heavy machinery, what I'm really referring to is learning to operate within an organizational framework to leverage that framework to affect change. I believe this is the skill set that is required to make an impact on a large scale. Now, as I shared with you in the first episode of this series, I do think it is absolutely 100% possible for a single person to make a significant impact on the world of another person. Think back to my stories about hurricane relief and building one-to-one pipelines for relief versus giant funnels. But there's another perspective that goes along with that. Many of the world's challenges are so great that they can't be impacted on the individual level. If you don't believe me, Go stop global warming today. These big challenges require the strength of much larger organizations, governments, large companies, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, universities, and others. John Hennessy, former president of Stanford University and now chairman of Alphabet Inc., which is Google's parent company, is well accustomed to tackling the big challenges of the world and making a massive impact. He used to talk about BHAGs, a term borrowed from the book by Jim Collins, Built to Last, Successful Habits of Visionary Companies. What are BHAGs? 
big, hairy, audacious goals. These are the massive challenges on the scale of humanity that require the mobilization of tremendous resources across extended time periods to achieve. Take one of the stated goals of SpaceX, for instance. Enable human exploration and settlement of Mars. Yeah, that sounds pretty audacious, but not necessarily novel in its ambition. It has its roots in 1961, when John F. Kennedy said, This nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. And that BHAG stated boldly by President Kennedy, it led to a massive mobilization of all of the resources available to the United States and ultimately success in landing on the moon on my birthday, July 20th, although it was July 20th, 1969, seven years before I was born. So from John F. Kennedy to John Hennessy, the top leaders in the world understand what it takes to inspire and mobilize massive organizations or entire countries to achieve objectives. What does this mean for you and me? If you want to have an impact at a large scale, there are really two basic options. Either you need to learn to find a way to get into existing organizations and to work effectively within those organizations, or you need to build an organization from scratch to pursue new and massive objectives. Each of these approaches has its own challenges, but don't worry, Datages is here to help. I'm going to share with you some very valuable insights and guidance today on engagement with major nonprofit institutions and on building nonprofit organizations from the ground up. Let's start with how to interface with existing nonprofits. The first thing to remember, if you have experience working in the for profit realm, is that nonprofit organizations, particularly large established organizations, don't operate in exactly the same way as for profit organizations. Just based upon statistical norms, most of you listening at this moment probably work independently or in a small to mid sized company. Most such professional environments are founded based on a spirit of entrepreneurism and achievement. By contrast, large, established, nonprofit organizations are predominantly built on institutionalized bureaucracy. Now, when you hear that word bureaucracy, you probably get a sour taste in your mouth. It's the kind of word you can't even really say with a smile. Try it. Look in the mirror. You probably have a scowl on your face when you say bureaucracy. But after nearly two decades of working in established institutional bureaucracies, I can share with you that I've come to not only accept, but to appreciate their existence. Obviously, there are times when I would argue against the outcomes of these bureaucracies, just as I did in the earlier episode when I talked about my experiences with the Red Cross and the Salvation Army during Hurricane Katrina. The examples I shared showed how institutional, charitable organizations can limit the positive impacts and innovative spirit of an individual. However, here's the important counterpoint I've come to understand primarily through my experience in higher education. I believe that no one person, and really even no one generation of people, ought to be able to grab the wheel of a major institution and change its trajectory. Universities, long-standing foundations, even governments, all have checks and balances and guardrails within their bureaucratic structures that serve to slow the pace and the severity of change. And when you take into account the fact that most mistakes in life are made from action rather than inaction, this actually makes a lot of sense. Change in major institutions ought to be incremental and measured, and their overall direction must remain on course, not vacillate from year to year or even decade to decade. So in this setting of institutionalized bureaucracy, how does one individual actually make an impact? There are really two strategies, and they're not mutually exclusive. Strategy one, learn to work within the institution. Or strategy two, learn to work outside the institution in a way that can influence the institution and affect a positive change. Learning to work within a nonprofit institution takes time and patience. But over time, it can lead to demonstrable impacts that can be very fulfilling and rewarding personally once you can reach that point of maximum positive impact. When I first started working as an engaged alum at Stanford, my impression was that the impact one individual could have upon an institution of that size 
could probably fit inside a thimble. After several years of working with Inspire and building a group of hundreds of individuals aligned around a common set of goals, I felt like my thimble had grown into a bucket. And having spent nearly two decades now working closely with Stanford and developing a skill set and a sixth sense in an institutional context that allows me to read the pulse of the institution accurately, I feel that bucket has now become a barrel. Let me share with you just a couple of key principles that will assist you in growing your impact in large institutions, help you find your bucket or your barrel. The first one I call my surfing analogy. I've learned that in a large organization, you have to learn to watch the horizon. You have to look out for waves in the distance headed your way. And when you see a wave approaching, you have to paddle like hell to get into that wave and catch it. If you ignore the waves and are just paddling in your own direction, those waves will crush you rather than propel you. I'm hopeful that the meaning of this illustration is obvious to you. In a large institution, You can't create your own waves that are large enough to surf, and you certainly can't fight against the tide. It is critical to keep your eyes and ears open, to engage with as many stakeholders as possible around the organization, and to really pay attention to what is happening. If you have a specific objective, keep asking yourself these questions. What are the existing priorities of the organization or the stated goals for the future that best align with my objectives? How can I participate in those initiatives being advanced by the organization already? How can I weave my own objective into those endeavors? Aligning yourself with the organization's objectives and just being there to give a gentle nudge, as my wife would say, is a far better strategy for success than trying to pursue your objectives in isolation or in opposition to the objectives of the institution. The second piece of advice has to do with money. Simply put, most organizations, particularly nonprofits, only actively seek out contributions in the form of money. This is not because they're mercenary. It's principally because taking money is easy. It takes very little infrastructure or organization to cash a check or run a credit card. Engaging in a meaningful way with volunteers to get beyond treasure and cash in on their time and talent requires real infrastructure an organization on the part of the institution, and many are simply ill-equipped to do so or not sufficiently motivated to take on these challenges. I often say that money doesn't solve all of your problems, but it can certainly make it easier to solve some of them. That'll probably be a future dadage. My point in this case is that sometimes the easiest pathway to affect change at an institutional level is to participate in support of the institution financially and to leverage that financial participation to find an appropriate way to impact the management of the organization and its objectives. I emphasize the word appropriate here because there are certainly examples of inappropriate uses of funds from donors to try to exert improper influence or control over organizations. What are some proper and effective means of using financial contributions to cultivate opportunities to engage an institution? One simple one is through an open discussion about opportunities to participate in boards or committees. Depending on the size of the organization and the size of your capacity and desire to give, the organization may be open to a discussion about you joining the board of trustees or the board of directors. In other circumstances, there may be other boards or committees devoted to specific initiatives or areas of focus for the organization. I always find myself being asked to join the real estate, finance, or land and buildings committee of organizations given my professional background. Another effective method of leveraging financial contributions for organizational impact is through directed giving. This is becoming more and more the norm in development for large nonprofit institutions. The donor population at large is becoming less and less interested in supporting large organizations and more and more interested in investing behind specific initiatives. This is particularly the trend in higher education. We talked in a previous episode about how much higher ed has come under fire in recent years. Donors are less trusting of throwing money into a giant pool of funds, particularly if they're questioning current initiatives, leadership, or policies of the institution. A good friend of mine put it this way in describing the campaign for our 25th reunion at Stanford this year. 
He said donors who are concerned with current events, policies, or leadership in a university are left with three choices, really. One, don't give because you don't support what's going on right now. Two, give because you support the long-term vision of the institution, even if you aren't happy about current events. Or three, be an activist philanthropic investor and single out initiatives you do support and put your money to work behind those initiatives. Obviously, I fall into the third bucket. And if you're seeking to have a positive impact on a large institution, I'd recommend that approach for you as well. Often, though, I've found it too difficult to work from within an institution to affect change or make a positive impact, particularly when the desired impact is innovative or it's a departure from the way things have been done in the past. Basically, I'm talking about those cases where you can't find a wave or you risk getting crushed by a wave, as I explained in my surfing analogy. In these cases, I have found that it is far better to work outside of a larger institution. When you take this outside approach, though, you must be highly sensitive still to the objectives, the mission, and the fundamental values of the larger institution. And you must make sure you are always working in parallel, not against the institution. Most importantly, you must recognize that when you step outside of the confines and constraints of a bureaucratic organization, you are also stepping outside of the structure and the capabilities of the machine that makes up the organization. This means that you have to be ready to build your own machine, because as we have discussed, you can't accomplish big objectives on your own. So let's talk about Chad's principles for building a nonprofit organization. Here are five guidelines for nonprofit organization formation and growth. One, if you aren't getting people's attention, you aren't painting a big enough picture. In order to capture the attention of prospective volunteers, donors, constituents, members, supporters, whomever you're seeking, you have to be able to articulate the mission and the vision of the organization. Now, you may think these are the same thing, but they aren't. A vision statement focuses on tomorrow and what an organization wants to ultimately become. A mission statement focuses on today and what an organization does to achieve its objectives. Articulating a big vision for the organization is paramount. Don't be afraid to highlight the scope of impact that the organization can have in the long term at a full scale. This is not a commitment or a promise, so don't worry about being wrong. Things change over time, and everyone understands that. Be bold in stating the vision for your organization. Just don't pass the line of credibility. The mission of an organization needs to be specific and clear in order to articulate what you're doing right out of the gate and how you're going about doing it. And this leads me to principle number two. The larger the audience to whom you are speaking, the more succinct your message must be. A good friend of mine was running for state office in California, and he built his entire platform on two sentences. That's it. On the campaign trail, he just focused consistently on those two things because he was trying to communicate to a very large audience. No matter what the size of your target base of stakeholders, it is important to properly package your message. You hear me talk a lot on datages and groups of concepts. I'm doing it right now. I'm in the middle of giving you a list of five principles. Whether you're talking about it in lists or buckets or pillars, it's important to help people visualize the components of your plan. And let me emphasize the word visualize. The more you can show, not tell, show your constituents your message, the better it can be understood and then disseminated to others. When I formed Spire, Stanford Professionals in Real Estate, the very first things I invested time and money into were getting a professional graphic designer to create a logo and producing a visually compelling presentation deck about the organization. A picture is worth a thousand words. It's also worth a thousand bucks. Principle number three. If your HR doesn't follow your mission, you don't really have a mission. When you start to raise money, spend it. And spend it by investing in good people to build a staff for the organization. Nonprofit organizations are obviously heavily dependent upon volunteers, but that won't get you to the promised land. It must be somebody's day job to execute on the specific objectives articulated in the mission of the organization. You don't have to build a full HR infrastructure out of the gate. Keep it simple. 
hire key personnel as independent consultants initially while you get up and going. We talked all the way back in the second episode of Datages about team building. Go back and listen again. All of those principles apply to hiring for nonprofits. And while staff is essential to building a viable organization, volunteer leadership is still important too. That brings me to principle number four. Build an effective team of volunteer leaders around you. Get ready. Here come the buckets again. I have so many buckets. I should probably be a volunteer firefighter. In this case, I'm going to give you three buckets of people that are required to launch effectively a volunteer-driven nonprofit organization. The three groups of people you need are A, those who are willing to roll up their sleeves and join you in doing some of the heavy lifting. B, those who can lend their name and identity in support of an organization, even if they never do anything else, but their presence and endorsement alone create credibility. And finally, bucket C, money. You need individuals inspired by your leadership and ready to support it financially. When you look to engage these people, follow principles one through three, and you'll have much more success. Paint the big picture of your vision, articulate your mission, explain that you will spend the resources you receive wisely, including a hiring plan for maximum results, and then be politely persistent in your follow-up. Don't be afraid to ask people to participate multiple times. Just make sure you listen each time and refine your ask based upon what you hear from them in response. And whatever is right for them to give of their time, money, or reputation, take it. That's where principle number five comes in. There is no such thing as a small contribution. Whatever someone is willing to do for an organization or give to that organization is amazing. The most important variable is engagement. The more people you can engage in your organization in any capacity, the stronger the organization will become. And there's truly a viral effect. Each volunteer you engage opens up their network to you. You have created one more apostle who's going to be out there in the community talking about your amazing organization. And why is the organization so amazing in the minds of these new apostles? Simply because they're a part of it. Keep in mind that Whenever anyone does anything for your volunteer organization, by definition, they don't have to. Thank them. Overthank them. The real commodity of value you have to offer them is gratitude. Don't skimp on the gratitude. It will pay off in the long term through greater engagement of that individual in your organization. I've now given you some great pieces of advice to get you started in engagement with existing not-for-profit organizations and some tools to help you get your own nonprofit off the ground. As we talked about in the last episode of Datages, I encourage you to make philanthropy a part of your life. Immerse yourself in the philanthropic world, and I promise you will reap the benefits and will grow as an individual. I certainly have. I'm eager to share with you now where that growth has led and where I find myself today as it relates to philanthropy. This may sound surprising given everything that I've shared about my wonderful experiences in the nonprofit world and what it has brought to my life, but I'm beginning to take some steps back and de-emphasize my participation in the not-for-profit space. Why? Let me try to explain some of the things I've learned in the past several years. First, there's effectively a cap on what can be accomplished in the nonprofit sector. In the last couple of episodes, I've shared with you some of the massive inefficiencies that exist within large-scale nonprofit organizations. And in the very last episode, I talked to you about what I call the Professor Peter Principle that exists in higher education, where brilliant academics are promoted to departmental operational leadership positions that are well outside of their education or experience in management. I've seen these kinds of inefficiencies over and over again firsthand, and the examples I've shared are just a few out of many. Generally speaking, there are structural problems in the nonprofit realm that cannot be overcome despite how much effort or intentionality there may be in trying to solve the issues. Let me provide you with just a few of these structural problems that I've witnessed firsthand. One of my fundamental principles in operating a business is alignment of incentives. In most cases, there are not incentive structures in place that create a win-win framework in which employees in the nonprofit sector are rewarded for their achievement on behalf of the organization. In many cases, 
Such incentives are actually viewed as distasteful or improper in the nonprofit sector. Additionally, total compensation available to staff and lead executives in the nonprofit world is likely lower than for the equivalent positions in other industries. Obviously, there are exceptions to this in the form of top-heavy, massive charities with bloated executive salaries, but generally speaking, it is hard to attract the best of the best leadership for the nonprofit sector as a result of compensation disparities. Then we talked about bureaucracy and red tape. As I shared earlier, I've come to understand, accept, and appreciate it for what it is and for why it is. That doesn't mean that it doesn't still get in the way. Bureaucratic organizations suffer from what I describe as a collective consciousness. This is not a trait reserved for the nonprofit world alone. I've seen it in some for profit environments as well. The collective consciousness, as I describe it, is a phenomenon that results from an internal decision making process that removes the people closest to a problem or an opportunity from the parties making the decisions that will shape the organization's approach to the matter. Further, it introduces multiple siloed parties, each with its own agenda and perspectives that create a politicized, entrenched, and dissociated decision-making framework that is far afield from what any of us would recognize as plain and simple logic. Trying to attach logic to an evaluation of the decision-making of large institutions can be a frustrating and mind-melting exercise. From firsthand experience, I can share with you that even someone who has invested as much time as I have in studying and understanding nonprofit institutions and who has spent even more time building and refining my own skill set and navigating these institutions, I still hit stumbling blocks, walls, ceilings. It's easy to come away bruised and battered. At some point, I recognize that no matter how much well intentioned time and energy I put into the nonprofit sector, I will always come up short in one critically important measure. What is the amount of positive impact I can make with my time invested? At the end of the day, it's really about opportunity cost. Am I making the best investment of the limited time I have on this earth by devoting it heavily to the nonprofit world? The answer is simply no. This doesn't mean I would walk away from philanthropy altogether. To the contrary, I'm recommitting myself to philanthropic pursuits through what I have referred to as for-profit philanthropy. Every time I say these words to someone, particularly someone in the nonprofit space, I get a funny scrunched face look in response as if I just gave them a shot of lemon juice. The next words I usually get are, what does that mean? I'll try to explain it for you now. There are many for-profit enterprises that are doing great things in the world. I believe in supporting organizations, companies, and individual entrepreneurs that are mission-driven and focused on making a positive societal impact. And what does that support look like? It comes in many forms. Investment is one. As I evaluate investing my money in companies, I seek out those that fit my criteria in terms of positive impact on the world. One of the other key forms of engagement for me is mentorship and advising. I invest a lot of time working with entrepreneurs who are pursuing amazing things and helping them get their ventures off the ground and moving them in the right direction. Wherever possible, when I'm passionate about a particular venture, I try to formalize my participation through a role on the advisory board or the board of directors. In taking on these roles, investor, advisor, board member, there is almost always an opportunity for me to profit from the eventual success of the companies. This is a win-win potential, and it's something that I'm really seeking right now. And this is a prime example of the concept of egoistic altruism, which we introduced two episodes ago. Not only am I more motivated to really engage and support these worthy organizations when there's some upside for me, but I feel much more invested in both the financial and emotional sense in what they're doing. And furthermore, there's a multiplicative effect that I have come to realize. When I donate money to a nonprofit organization, or time for that matter, it's gone. Even if I have done good through that investment, it's never coming back to me. On the other hand, if I invest in a for profit philanthropic pursuit and it works and it pays off, guess what? That money is coming back to me in multiples. And what am I going to do with it? I'm going to go buy a big boat. No way I would actually do that, but I can tell you what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to put that money back to work in support of other worthy initiatives. And if I multiply my own wealth enough, then I can return to the nonprofit sector and utilize that wealth to have a far greater impact on the world, a magnitude greater impact than I can have at my present level of wealth. So that's my theory behind for-profit philanthropy. Let me share some ways that I'm actively putting it to practice. The first example is a hybrid. I formed a new nonprofit organization focused on supporting meaningful for-profit objectives. SPAN, the Student Athlete Professional Advisory Network. SPAN is focused on supporting worthy NCAA student athletes and professional development opportunities while they are in school. Initially focused on a rollout at Stanford, SPAN is introducing an evolution of the new structure introduced by the NCAA, allowing student athletes to be compensated based upon the use of their name, image, and likeness, NIL. SPAN is introducing what we refer to as NIL Generation 2.0, which is focused on creating long-term engagement between students and professionals to foster professional development opportunities for student athletes to better prepare them for careers after school and sports. While the NIL Gen 2.0 structure is a for-profit structure as it relates to student-athletes, the nonprofit organization is building this framework to create a marketplace for meaningful engagement with alumni and corporate partners who want to invest in the futures of student-athletes. Visit the Datages Bulletin Board for a link to SPAN or go check it out at www.connectwithspan.org. Another exciting venture I'm pursuing is in the venture capital space. I've engaged with and am exploring an investment in an early-stage venture capital firm called Dangerous Ventures. Now, there's a name for a venture capital firm. Are they just being way too honest about the risks of venture capital, or is there something truly dangerous about what they're doing? Don't worry. You'll get to find out, because in an upcoming episode, I'll be interviewing Ward Hinden, who is one of the principals of Dangerous Ventures, and he will share his perspective on investment with a focus on positive societal impact and the overall thesis behind their fund, along with sharing stories from his role as a lecturer at UCLA Business School, helping to cultivate the leaders of tomorrow and helping them focus on making a positive impact in their careers. Much more on all of that to come. Finally, as I've been promising for a while now, I'm going to take you along with me on the evolution of my own career path, focusing on real estate development opportunities in Central and Eastern Europe. How is this an example of for-profit philanthropy? Let me explain the market opportunity and the for-profit piece, and then explain where the philanthropic focus comes in. Central Europe as a whole, and particularly Poland, is in the midst of an economic boom. The GDP growth in these countries is much higher than it is here in the United States over the last several years. There's also an evolution underway in commercial development, particularly retail, as people move out of the urban cores and into the suburbs. This was all accelerated by COVID. The commercial development required to keep up with this is right in my wheelhouse. Additionally, Poland had an influx of 2.5 million people from Ukraine and then from Russia fleeing the war, and experts are confident the relocation is permanent for many of them. Some say the number is even as large as 4 million right now. This represents one of the greatest migrations in modern human history, not in sheer numbers, but in total impact. These massive geopolitical events create tremendous opportunity and great need. Building housing and schools for the immigrants and putting in place support systems for them are critical initiatives right now. This is where it is important to understand the partner firm with whom I'm engaged in Central Europe, White Star Real Estate. Brian Patterson is the chairman and a fellow member of the Stanford Alumni Real Estate Council. There are a couple of specific things about Brian that really motivate me to align with him and his organization. He is very much an entrepreneurial visionary who sees things for what they can be and not what they are today. And he has a very philanthropic focus behind everything he does. Brian is passionate about leveraging the White Star platform and their tremendous assets under management to produce innovations and sustainability and to exhibit civic responsibility. He was principally responsible for bringing Big Brothers Big Sisters to Central Europe, and he spent a significant amount of time focused on development of schools and educational infrastructure. Everything we pursue together in Central and Eastern Europe will further these objectives, and we plan to be perfectly poised to assist in the rebuilding of Ukraine when the time comes following the war. 
I can tell you it is very exciting to be working in an environment where there is so much opportunity coupled with so much ability to make a positive impact on the world. As I mentioned, I look forward to taking you on this journey with me, and I hope to get Brian on Datages as well. He has some amazing stories and perspectives to share. And in the meantime, listener, here's something I want you to consider. If you want to get involved with philanthropy at an institutional level, and you're looking for some direct advice, mentorship, and guidance in that regard, contact me. I want to help. If you're considering forming your own nonprofit organization, contact me. I want to help. If you have a for-profit venture that is mission-driven and focused on a positive impact on the world, contact me. I want to help. I'm willing to put the resources of Chad Hagel, Datages, and our entire network to work in support of you. How do we start that conversation? Easy. Drop me a line. Chad at datages.com. Let's make something happen. And before we part today, here's a dad joke going back to our discussion earlier about bureaucracies. What do bureaucrats use to wrap Christmas gifts? Lots of red tape. Remember, listeners, dad may not always know what he's talking about, but he sure can sound like he does. Thank you for listening to Datages. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to visit datages.com and subscribe to the Datages podcast to get notified for future episodes. You can rate or review on Spotify and Apple Podcast. Why? Because I'm your father and I said so. Just a little respect is all I ask for. I put a roof over your head and food on the table and what do you do? No, tell me exactly what do you do because I'm doing everything. I'm paying for everything. No, get back here. Get back here right now.